I don't know where to start with this gentleman because he is one of the most powerful people in the music industry today. This guy is the gatekeeper to the careers of so many wannabe and aspiring artists and rappers. Um, I have watched him climb from the bottom and work his way up to the top of the industry. The fact that he is even in this room is so impressive because he spends so much time traveling around not just this country, but traveling around the world. This is a guy who has worked at, well, I won't give it all up, but he has climbed his way from BET to MTV to Revolt to Spotify, now over at YouTube. Please get a, give it up for this week's Power Move maker, Mr. Tuma Basa. right here like stand up for a second I, him just being in this room this is this for me it's my honor to have you oh, and I'm so man. looking forward to having a conversation and for you to share your jewels and your wisdom and hopefully inspire somebody in this room to climb to success oh, ready. <laughs> what's up Sean to what up Press. brother I'm good like I said, I have watched this gentleman um, for so many years work his way from the bottom to, to where he is now. And um, I think that this is going to be one heck of a conversation. So thanks for being here. No, thank you for having me. Having okay. Tuma, yeah. I got to start out here. <laughs> you are originally from Zaire. I was born there. But my family came from Rwanda in the 1950s. Rwanda. Yeah. So Okay, is everybody clear? Zaire, Rwanda, Africa, yes. like okay. the motherland. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So 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 this guy, your family is originally yeah. from Rwanda. Yep. Born in Zaire, Zaire now yep. known as the Republic of Congo. Yeah, Democratic okay. Republic of Congo. They changed the name like in the nineties. Because it was Congo back in the day when the Belgians had it, uh -huh. and then Mobutu was a dictator, and he became president, and he just renamed the country Zaire. Do you know it, why? Because it was the river. It was Zaire was so he so I guess he wanted to distance himself from the Belgians, and uh, and the Kikongo people are a specific people in it, and there were so many other tribes. Mm -hmm. So when he got overthrown, Kabila. He he brought back Congo, so I guess it depends on who's in who's in charge on what the name is. That is the same place, the Rumble in the Jungle, yeah. Muhammad Ali, yeah. the same side. Yeah, I was born a year <laughs> later. But wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Rumble in the Jungle. How long did you live there? Five years. So we left. I was five years old. We moved to the states, and then um, then we left the states again when I was thirteen. Okay. To where? Zimbabwe. You you moved back to Zimbabwe. Yeah. For how long? Six years, seven years, almost seven years. I, all my high school, a year and a half of college, uh, Zimbabwe, like so, uh, 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 my whole teenage years, I, uh, you know, I was Zimbabwe. I had no idea. So I guess it begs the question, like yeah. you are one of the most powerful people in hip hop. Oh, I, I wouldn't call it powerful. Okay, yeah. you are one of the most powerful people in hip hop. Let, nah, let me just I'm say. Maybe one of the best good looking, <laughs> the most good looking, you know what I mean? But, 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 but yeah. is hip hop big there? Yeah, well, so at that time, hip hop, this is, okay, so now this is the late 80s, early 90s. Uh -huh. So that time, hip hop was still kind of niche, right? But the people who were into it were very passionate about it, and we all kind of knew each other. You know, we would trade cassettes, we would dub each other's. So if I had Kooji Rap and DJ Polo, Live and Let Die, or whatever, and you had, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know, like MC Ray, yeah, LL Kooji, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'd trade, I would dub yours, you know what I mean? You know, you know, they used to have those little the double cassette things. So, so it was kind of, that's where I learned how to network, because of hip hop actually, because I would also get the Yo! MTV raps and Rap City from the States, because remember I still had my friends in the States, uh -huh. and they would send VHS's, they would record my boy Petty, 
would record uh, uh, UMTV raps, etc. And then my dad would go to the States and, and he would bring back tapes and sneakers. That's all we wanted was tapes and sneakers. And, and we'd watch those things, memorize, life is too short, know every word, you know what I mean? Like, in Fat Five Freddy, Dr. Dre, Ed Lover, Rap City, like, uh, the, like the, the old, old ones, you know? And, 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 and then we'd trade with other people like, and I would go to other countries even. My uncle was a, a doctor in Swaziland. So this is Zimbabwe, this is South Africa, this is Swaziland. I'll go to Swaziland, and then my boy Sylvester, who was a big Gangstar fan, and Linda Magagula, who was the one who, the first time I ever heard Jiru the Damage had come clean, was on one of his cassettes. I was like, yo, I need to, I need to double You know, that. it's so funny you know? because hip hop is such a grassroots yeah. music, right? Yeah. And you're talking and you're, you know, we live in the States at the time, but that's exactly how we did it. We go to school and we were dubbing from one another. Yeah. We're up late listening to the radio. But you had it on the radio. For us, it was hard because even like for a song to get on the radio, it had to be very, very popular mm -hmm. and it would be late. So if someone would be popping in the UK, London, then it would all of a sudden be popping in Zimbabwe or South Africa or Swaziland, you know? So in the early 90s, especially, and by the way, I wanted to be a rapper. My name was B to my B. No, actually, I was a rapper. I okay, because I was going to get to that. Okay, you, okay, okay, okay. From what I understand, you were a rapper. Were yeah, you a rapper but, here in the States, or were you a rapper? No, there. I had already... In Zimbabwe. Yeah, I already let it go. I actually just did it. Uh, uh, I, was, I was just talking about it uh, overseas, about if at that time I let it go, because there was no incentive to develop my talent, right? There was no a rs there was no magazine editors. You, it wasn't a big city like a New York or, or you know, Houston or Miami where you could create like a critical mass and get on the radar of a magazine editor or, you know what I mean, et cetera. There was nothing, right? Zimbabwe, ZBC Radio 3. So I just did a little uh, talk about like if B2B, born 1975, like there was nothing I could do. So I had to let it go. I had to let go of this dream, right? And say, you know what? There's no incentive. I'm not going to make any money and be... B to a B, nobody cares. No one was checking for B to a B, and I wasn't even that good, right? <laughs> but I, wait, but I could have become better if I had the incentive to develop the talent or the opportunities. But now, if B to a B was born in 2000, he would be little to a B. There you go. And he'd be on YouTube. It would be popping. <laughs> he'd be better than, bigger than Drake or Kanye, right? Because it's right there, and that's what's happening right now with African music right now. It's like, back in the day, you had no opportunity. Like, there was no way you could make money. And then, and even if you came from a little bit of money, if your parents had a little bit of money, they'd be like, what do you do? Are you crazy? You want to be an artist? But now that you have YouTube and social media and WhatsApp, and you know what I mean? Like, now you can get it popping. Like, Correct. you see what I'm saying? Because, so, Lil Tuma B is, would have been popping. Like, I was just <laughs> born 25 years too early. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. so so when you realized yeah. B Tuma B wasn't going to become the next LL Cool J, I'm assuming, and especially coming, and if I'm wrong, yeah. your, your father's an educator. Yes, he's a professor, yeah. Yep, he's an educator. How the, important was education. education in your family? It is the, so important. Like, so, so important. And, and, and also, like, so... I mean, I, I ended up, like, even later on, even after I got into the music business, I ended up doing an MBA uh, at, at NYU Stern School of Business. What'd you study? Uh, management. Management? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Just management. It was Because I was going to, I was working at MTV while I was going to school. So, which was probably the most stressful time of my life, trying to, you know, like, like literally I'd wake up, the alarm clock, drink a Red Bull, do homework or study, get to uh, the office, and then after that, meet up with the, my study group, you know what I mean? Drink like three Red Bulls. It was like a bad health time. That's probably one of you. you, you, you I, I don't want to skip too far forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talked about MTV. Yeah. That was that your first industry job? No, BT. BT. No, 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 no. BT was my first paying job. Okay, let's stop there for okay, a second. Okay, all right, yeah. Because before you walked in, we're talking about interning and the importance. Oh of yeah. So, my first internship was actually with EMI Records. I was in Iowa. At University of Iowa, a t Greyhound had a, 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 a Greyhound had a, a special sixty nine dollars anywhere in the country, and I was delivering barbecue, right? And my, the place I delivered barbecue went out of business, so I was about to get thirteen weeks of unemployment, <laughs> and I wanted to do internships, but I couldn't afford it, right? Because it's like unpaid, and then I'm uh, Iowa City, so obviously I'm about to get thirteen weeks of unemployment. 
And I mean, that means I could pay my car payment in Iowa and go to New York where my cousin lived. My cousin lived on 97th between Park and Madison before that was like Upper East Side. So I was, I was still with Spanish Harlem at that time. Mm-hmm. Like Puerto Rican day, day prayed you knew it was Spanish Harlem. You know what I mean? So at that time, the, now it's just like Upper East Side. So what happens, it feels like Upper East Side at least. So what happens is, so I took a bus, I came to New York, I made 800 cold calls. And, and it was actually frat. No, stop, we're both stop, stop. We're both It was actually frat stop, stop who looked there, out for stop me. Stop there for yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I grip you? Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? And whatever, yeah, yeah. Whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see this one. 580 Sigma in the house? Yeah. So what happened was this. I come to New York. I made, the reason I know I made 800 cold calls is because my cousin got the bill. At the time, there was a company called 9X. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And 9X, she was like, yo, who made the 800 of these local calls? I was like, oh, I didn't know you get charged per call. Because <laughs> in Iowa, you didn't get, you got a flat fee, it was US West. We didn't have 9X there. And they were like, so that's how I know I've made 800 cold calls. And I, uh, frat, um, there's a, a few, because I didn't have, I didn't know anyone out here. A few helped me out. Anthony Biney Amisa was mm-hmm. one. He was at Polygram Records. Uh, Charles Austin, uh, who had uh, worked with Theo Settlemeyer. Uh, and I ended up getting something at EMI Records, but EMI went out of business like two or three weeks in. Can, can, can I interject for one yeah. second? You made 800 cold calls. Yeah. So I was just in an attempt to get an internship. An internship? Yeah. Well, I had gone all the way from Iowa and paid 69 bucks. If, if, if you, know you I mean? are watching this video or if you are in this room and you think you're doing something oh. by making 20 calls or no, uh, uh, no. like uh, walking uh, to Junior's Cheesecake I mean, for a record deal, you are doing nothing. Uh, this is what it takes to become successful. Uh, uh, to, get, no, to get an unpaid internship. <laughs> Forget about successful. <laughs> to get unpaid. So... What happened was this. So I go, I come to New York, I'm staying at my cousin's house. She was helping me go to Kinko's resume paper. We even showed up to Sony Music. I even, show, the irony is we even showed up to MTV, but it was naive and ineffective, but like, it's almost like, like those DMs, like people just DMing. Well, like I just showed up and the security guard, I didn't know they were gonna have security guards. Like, no, you can't, you know what I mean? And I even remember one woman uh, helped me like try to get an internship, not internship, a temp a- application. What happened was um, EMI Records, but then also they go out of business. Tony Ward, I was international marketing, and then uh, Theo Settlemeyer, mm-hmm. right? Who was just starting out, and he uh, Charlie Austin had worked with them, and Charlie, who was from uh, Penn, from Philadelphia, and he said, so Theo said, you can come. Theo was just starting, brand new, him and Randy Cutler. I go intern for them, because I told my parents I was gonna be an entertainment lawyer, because that's how they were like, okay, you can't do this entertainment industry, hip hop stuff. I said, but I'll be an entertainment lawyer. Oh, lawyer, okay. Because <laughs> you have to remember, immigrant parents, they sacrificed a lot. They don't want to see you throwing away their sacrifices f- for some pipe dream. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's just, anyone who has immigrant parents knows how T- the kind of social pressure inside the household and the, the, and the lack of understanding that this is actually a way of making money and it's not like just for fun, that it's a real job. So I said, lawyer, I said, okay. So ended up getting with Theo, and this is 1997, a year before Eminem, because Theo ended up becoming Eminem's lawyer, and then now he's like Drake's lawyer, he's like Correct. DJ Khaled's mm-hmm. lawyer, he's Post Malone's lawyer, Kodak Black's lawyer. The, uh, so many people, like, you, you know, he, there's just so many people to mention that he, but that was before, that was a year before he got his first big client. And then that time, you know who his guys were? Who? At the time. At the time, and he, uh, fr- like Frankie uh, Cutlass, Frankie Cutlass, Dance. Puerto Rico. Yep. No, yep. is it yep. Frankie yep. Knuckles? Yep. Was it Puerto Rico? Oh, those are that guy. That's Cutlass. That Cutlass, Frankie That's Cutlass. Me. It was uh, um, uh, DV Alias Christ, like Trigger the Gambler, Smooth but, the but, Hustler. But, uh, That's Brooklyn. Uh, Craig G. Craig G. But, that, but, but here's the point, yeah. which I think is a very important point. You don't, uh, and, and, I, and I spoke about this before Tune walked in, and for anybody who's watching this on video, everybody wants to become friends with the person on top. Everybody wants to become person with the, friends with the person who's already established and popping. Listen to a story. At the time yep. that you were 
yeah. making these inroads and you haven't, these were your peers. These were yeah. people who were starting out on their journey. So it's so important. Stop worrying about the people who are already established. The people who are going to really help you in your career and come up with you are the ones who are sitting right next to you right now. Those are the ones you should be establishing relationships with. And, and the, my next internship, because I did a third internship the next year at BT like in life. Washington, D.C. Because I try to get a job. I have all the rejection letters still. I have them in storage in Jersey. Like, literally, I kept everything in a binder like baseball cards. Like, I was like, okay, I'm going to look. You know what I mean? Like, everything. So my next year, I go to D.C. I, I go back to Iowa to graduate because you can't go to law school unless you graduate. So I go back to Iowa to graduate. And uh, uh, I, I get internship with BET in Washington, D.C. And there, that's where, like, my, like, like lifelong, like, like, the people I've really come up with, uh, Eric Parker and One Nine, who did, like, they, they did the filmmakers, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the guys, at Damar Anderson, uh, Alex Gonzalez. These are the guys who are still, like, my friends up today. We're all, like, starting out together. You know what I mean? And, and like, kind of... DC is really where, because in New York, I was just running around going to a lot of parties, and you know what I mean? Like, like but for you know, anybody who uh, doesn't know, BET used to be, they, they based out of Washington, DC. So him going to DC to work with It was DC, strategic, by the way. It was strategic. I'll tell okay, you why it was strategic. Explain. So Tony Ward, who was my intern supervisor at EMI, said something to me. He, he, he had read an article about Atlanta being the new Motown, it was in the New York Times. And he said something to me. It was like he wrote a letter. Uh, he said, "Don't come to New York right away. Like there's a, there's a lot of a lot of competition at the entry level, right? Go to a medium-sized market and get experience." So I, I applied to the uh, Minneapolis, uh, um, Terry uh, Lewis and uh, uh, Jimmy Jam, Jimmy Jam, Terry, Terry Lewis, yeah. a flight time. I applied. Teddy Riley, little, little man. I got to believe you Madeline. applied to L.A. LA Reed. Yes, yeah, LaFace. I have LaFace, that rejection yep. letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I told L.A. Reed about it recently. <laughs> How about uh, rap a lot? No, I didn't. No? Because I didn't have uh, any kind of way of getting there. Like, okay. you know what I mean? Because at least Atlanta had, like, family. My parents lived in Alabama. You know, Minneapolis wasn't far from Iowa. You know, D.C., I was able to get, like, part of a leadership program. So I actually got help, you know, in order to do an unpaid internship. And I did it. And we did loopholes because I graduated, so I worked with my with the University of Iowa. I was like, yo, can you put my graduation date like a little bit later so I can get academic credit for this? You know what I mean? Because they nice, wouldn't, you know nice. what I mean? So I marched and did the whole graduation thing like ceremonially, but they kept me registered so I could get academic credit. You know what I mean? We did a little trick, mm -hmm. right? Not trick, but like, you know, life hack, you know? So what happened was we go, where am I? Oh, so that was strategic. To get down experience, to, to get yep. experience. Mm -hmm. And then BET, uh, and actually, I only got that internship because I was nice to someone. You wanna know how? Hmm. We had a reception. And I was, by the way, I'm looking for a job. I'm not looking for another internship. I've done enough internships. And, and we had a reception, and it was like for the students of color to get internships. So I was like the student leader and of this organization. And no one was talking to this woman who drove from Omaha, Nebraska to Iowa. And so I kind of felt like this duty to talk to her because everyone was talking to all the sexy internship places. So I go, I was like, hey, what do you do? She's like, oh, we do government internships in DC. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, have you done internships? I was like, I've done two. Well, one and a half because the other one closed down while I was there. And it was like, she was like, uh, what, do, what do you want to do? I was like, entertainment. She said, you know, we had someone at BET once. I said, what? BET, because it's Iowa. We didn't have an urban station in Iowa. We watched, we wanted to watch uh, Puff or Jay or whoever, or Biggie at the time, because this is uh, the, the back then. We had to watch BET. And I said, BET? And she was like, yeah. And she was like, this is the contact at your campus. And I filled out all that, and it happened. Yeah, so that's how, it, it literally, I was just being nice. So how long did it take nice. you to get your first job? Once you interned at BT, so how long did you intern? I interned in the news department, and I, was, I had a very good relationship with my supervisor, Chris Hartch Melville. Eric Park was also in the news department. And do you guys know, uh, you watch the Today Show? You know the lady, she's um, like a little lighter skin than me, um, Chanel Jones. 
you know, there's like Al Roker, and then there's like two, Chanel Jones, right? Yep. She was also intern with us. No way. I kid you not. She, she lives here in New York now. And uh, so we were all interns in the news department. Me and Eric told Chris, we're like, yo, we're not interested in the news. Like, we're doing Tavis Smiley and Lead Story and all that stuff. We're interested in the music department at BET. So on Fridays, she used to let me go work, a uh, volunteer in the music department. So it was a dude named Dave Hawley got accepted to law school. And this lady, Tia Smith, has shown me how to do everything. Like, you know what I mean? She was like, like the, the, the grunt work. You know, like data entry, carrying the tapes to the music video library, all that stuff, right? And when he got accepted to law school, because he was on the waiting list, they had an opening. And I just happened to be finished with school. And so they offered me a freelance position, and I, it was $18,000 a year. And Greg Diggs, who was the music director, said, yeah, we have this, it doesn't pay much, it's like 18, blah, blah, blah. I'll take it. <laughs> And then he, then he upped it to 20,000 because he was so, he felt sorry for me. Like I took it so fast. He's like, well, dude, and I took it. And, and that was basically my, my first paid job. And I was just happy to be there. I lived in the hood in DC until I could get out of the hood. And you know what I mean? That's yeah. such a great story to him because people don't realize the grind that it takes, not just to get to the top, but to get in. Yeah. Just get your foot in the door. And it's worse now. And the now. patience. And the doing whatever it takes. The beg, borrowing, stealing that it takes. You know, I took five internships. Wow. And on my fifth, I got my first paying job. Wow. It was more than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made no, no. $23,000 a year, but. Yeah, but that's New York, though. New York is more expensive than DC. But the point of the matter is, <laughs> sometimes it takes that long to just get your foot in the door. But if you're passionate about something, stick with it. Yeah. BET. Moved to New York. How long, how long were you there? Four years. Four years BET? And then we moved to New York in the second year. That's when I worked with Did Terrence. you have the opportunity to program while you were down there? No, no, uh-uh. Because you have to remember, we already had people. So when I was at BET, I did like the things like I was a point person to send the videos to, get the edits out, fax the playlists, because playlists used to come out on Tuesdays before labels had their marketing meetings on Wednesdays. So I'm the one who's faxing to the people like, what are the ads? You know, and then also you had like guys like Kelly G, you know what I mean? Steven came uh, two years in. Steven was, Steven, Steven Hill. Hill. Uh, yeah, so he came, so I had like, I went through three regimes before we even went to Steven Hill. It was Greg Diggs, Lydia Cole, and then it was Paul Porter with uh, Sidney Mahmood, and then it was Kelly G and Stephen Hill. But I was that guy who just kept things going, and then when we, and Stephen came, he moved us to New York. So that was the third regime. So this was, is when BT gets its first set of offices in New York. In 106th and 106th in Park Avenue, 106th Street Park Avenue Anybody in ever hear the show 106 in Park? Yeah. It was actually named after the first offices yep. for BT. They were actually up on 106th yep. in Park Avenue. Yep, with Terrence. Terrence was there. And, yeah. and just so you guys know, I know he won't be seen on video, but Terrence has been at BT forever. Another highly respectable guy in the music industry in the hey. building. <clears throat> and then, oh, go, uh, go ahead. Just, just in terms of because I got so much to cover with you yeah, in yeah. such a short period no, no. of time. Yeah. Why did you leave BT? Well, well, the, it was, that was more of a reality thing, right? And the, I, I did want to be like uh, the, the guy who did the programming, right? So, it, so I was, they were letting me do stuff, right? Like BT Uncut, like Kelly was very, very inclusive. And we had a show called Fade to Black, which was like old school stuff. But I wanted to be a little bit more deeply in it. And MTV had started something called MTV Jams. and and they were, they were getting a little bit more aggressive with their uh, hip hop mm -hmm. and uh, R&B programming. Uh, they had a show with Direct Effect, et cetera, et cetera. So when they flipped MTVX, which was a heavy metal channel to MTV Jams, they needed like somebody. So it was me and Butterman. Butterman was already there. And uh, a lady named Beth uh, left to Arista. And, and so she was, her and Butterman used to program uh, Jams and uh, the, like the, the hip hop and R&B pure plays. There was like VH1 Soul, MTV Jam. So, so 
when that need happened and that opportunity, I there was there was no way in the world that I you know what I mean like I that I I knew exactly what I wanted and that was what I wanted. I wanted to go in. I wanted every day like 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 picking the, the so you the songs. go over there. What's your title? A manager of music programming initiatives. Okay, explain to the audience what a music programmer for because it's a difference between radio yeah. and television. Yeah. So. MTV was started by a lot of former radio people, so there's a lot of similarities in terms of like the software they used at the time, Selector, and uh, uh, the, the, the way that they uh, stratified their playlists, heavy rotation, medium rotation, thing, because their music logs are linear, like radio, where it's like 24-7, you know? So you have 168 hours of music programming to program for a week. And, and by the way, Every day has to be different. You play the same 40 songs, right? <laughs> so how do you keep that fresh? Or how do you make that so that when you come home at three o'clock from school, you're not seeing the exact same two videos that you saw? It's very difficult. That's like, you know what I mean? It's like make, creating puzzles, right? Right? So, the, so basically, um, it was from the acquisition process of the music videos, because these are music videos, and that's like getting them ready for air, right? Making sure they're clean, MTV standards, closed caption for, because of the law. There's a certain percentage of programming has to be closed captioned for the hearing impaired. Making sure that that uh, they're at the NOC, the operations center, and the, the right numbers, and et cetera. So the, once you get the acquisition part, then you have to schedule them, right? And, and well, no, first you have to select them. You have to filter, like because the only reason you're watching is because you don't have time to be like watching all these videos, et cetera. Well, those days it was kind of monopoly. Like you exactly. couldn't go to very many other places, except for like, uh, um, uh, um, much respect to Ralph McDaniel's Video Music Box, video music box you know what I mean? And, uh, and uh, MTV, I mean, not MTV, but BT, BT. And, and, and there was like one or two other channels, regional, in, in other countries too. So what happens is selecting them and then, uh, and then uh, communicating with the labels, label relations and artist relations, people, and, and you think that it's, uh, it's people mad? No, they just want to know the status. Like, they're like, hey, what's going on with my video? It only played like two times last year, last week. Like, like, oh, and they're like, okay, what's happening with it? So now you have to demonstrate the demand for it. So that's what we call a story. So Prez, is, who did this for many, many years, was like, this is what's going on. This is happening right now in the mid-Atlantic. This is the hottest song and it's spreading, right? And this, the, 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 the vehicle of that popularity is the DJs or the clubs or the mixtapes or, or et cetera, et cetera. And so they're working and making sure that you're informed. You're building relationships to this trust. So because I trust Prez, he's gonna tell me the actual truth. He'll tell me what the company line is. Oh, this is what the company expects, but this is what's really happening. So you have a little bit of time. So those relationships help the music programmer be better at what uh, they do because now you're reflecting the reality to the audience, right? Not only being subject to uh, an industry agenda or et cetera, because you have relationships, you can talk truth behind the, like, behind the, like at the dinner table, like, yo, what's really happening? Like, yo, this artist is like slipping and they, they doesn't want to put in the work, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can just think maybe that will change things and then you do it and then it doesn't change things, then like, okay, all right, cool. Well, we did our part. Let's move on to the next record, you know? It's like, oh yeah, well, that's, that's, a little, that's a summary. So was this your first real shot at programming? I know you had a taste well, of it at well, BT. Well, in terms of having full reign. Yes, that's in terms what of, I mean. yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had a lot of autonomy in terms of, because they tr even in the building, there was a lot of trust, right? Because it's all about because, trust. Because if I can remember correctly, the staff, the, the, it was small at that time. I want to say it was Elaine, was it? Was it was Elena, Elena yeah, she did Elena talent. Was there. Yep. Um, uh, who else was up there at that time? Butterman. It, but, it was yeah. a few of you guys, but I don't remember it being a big well, department. Well, because at the time, diversity was still like um, an issue. Like you know what I mean in terms of the the content and the representation of of uh, of hip hop. It, it, it was still up. So the news and docs was, uh, was a little bit more. There was like Ramon and Shaheem and Sway. You know what I mean. So so one of the things that we did internally was. We created a brain trust, and we did this on our own. Okay. Well, we just looked out for each other, 
Well, we just had a relationship. We shared information, who was coming to the building, what's actually happening, premieres that were about to happen. So that made us strong. Jason Rodriguez, later on Rob Markman, et cetera. So that made us strong. Joseph Patel, that made us strong because we, we on our own, fucked with each other. Our bosses didn't even talk to each other sometimes, but we fucked with each other. So that's how things like Hottest MCs would happen organically because that's just us, like, uh, Sean Lee, just just basically like uh, knowing that we were representing a culture. And one of the things that like that I took from there that I've taken to Spotify, I've taken to YouTube, is being an ambassador to the culture within the company. But when I'm out in the culture, I'm an ambassador for the company. You see what I'm saying? So so there's like that duality in terms of representation. And, and oh, oh, go ahead. And, and if I can remember correct, I know you were programming at Jams. Yeah, and you also, also started free. With, with, with MTV2. Yeah, I also did Sucker Free. Yeah, you yeah. did Sucker Free. Well, that was later on. Jenny Rosello did the early part. Mm-hmm. And then and then when she like uh, moved on or whatever, I, that's when me and a guy named Todd Rose really. And Sucker, but Sucker Free was uh, more of like a countdown. It was more like this is what's hot. Like it, there wasn't, that, that, that was, there wasn't, there was more manual than. Like art- I'm not dissing Soccer Free, but I'm just saying jams. You were able to like be creative and do sets, and you know what I mean. Things that DJs and, do. And I hope you know for anybody who's watching this on video, anybody who's in the room, listen to the names. He's going by them really quickly, but he is naming now heads of industry: Rob Markman, yeah, um, Sway from yeah. Sway's Universe. You just named so many people who are still in the game, who are still you know operating at a high level. But these are people who you came up with, which seems to be oh, yeah. a, a, a reoccurring theme during this conversation. Um, yeah. You leave MTV, you head on over to Revolt. How does Revolt? that happen? Uh, Prez put in a call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know? Well, I mean, well, 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 the, well, the, well, there was rumors of Revolt happening. I really just wanted to consult in the beginning. So mm-hmm. I called Prez, I called Michelle James, I called uh, Bentley. You know what I mean? People who I knew uh, had Puff's ear, and I was like, "Yo, can you put in a, a, a good word?" This is really what happened, literally. Yeah. yeah this was a, so I was like, "Put a good word." Uh, at the time, they were interested in someone full time. They weren't interested in like a consultant because I had relocated to Atlanta. I was doing jams remotely from Atlanta, and you know things were happening politically in the MTV building, that, and I was far away. So I was like, "I don't know. I don't want to put my eggs in this basket, right?" And so I wanted to consult, but they wanted someone full time. And Puff, and Andre, and uh, Andy Schoen were like, "You have to relocate. You have to come to LA." And, uh, and literally, my interview was like an interrogation. Like literally, they were like, "Puff, the first day, what are you playing? Who are the poor righteous teachers?" <laughs> I was like, "Whoa!" I was like, "I don't want this job if this is what's gonna happen." And Andy Schoen was laughing, and Andre was like egging him on, and I was like. I was like, I don't need to do this. I was like, I have an MBA. I can go, I can go, I can go work at Wall Street if I want to. Like, like, like this is literally because I had to like push back. Like, yo, like, like chill, like, you know. But they gave me an offer and I relocated to LA, which was one of the best things that ever happened. And even things like Spotify would not have happened if that didn't happen. Because um, what it did was it shook my belief system. I was all of a sudden... I didn't know I was getting older. I had spent 10 years at MTV. And I go to Revolt and there's all these kids and they were on Snapchat and they were Vine. And I was like, what is this? What's going on? I'm on Twitter. I'm, I'm just happy. <laughs> and these kids, they literally changed my life and they rejuvenated my career because they put me on to so much stuff. And, and Sean could tell you, Puff has this thing where He'll, he'll get in your head and you'll start believing that you're old. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you'll be like, yo, who, you need cultural touchstones. Who's keeping your ear to the street? You're not out there. I'm in the clubs more than you. And I'm like, oh, yes. I'm like, yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was almost like a you boot know, camp. I, I look at Eddie Lopez in, 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 in the audience as well, another former bad hey, boy alumni. Yeah, oh, yeah. And um, he's cracking up right uh, yeah. now because he understands Puff's way of getting in your head and getting the best out of you. Yeah. So go and ahead. You, you start believing it. And, and w- one of the things that I, I, I say was one of the... Most and first and foremost, what was your role at, at uh, the Revolt? Vice President of Music Programming. Okay. So Puff made me in charge of like all the music, not just like the urban music or whatever. He was like, 
you're gonna do all of this shit. And I was like, all right, cool. So which was great responsibility and leadership ex experience that I, I, I wasn't, that wasn't what I was looking for, but it's what I got. And, and, and I, that, that really helped me a lot too. Um, can, I, can I ask yeah. you a question? BT was established when you get there. Yeah. MTV obviously started it all. Yeah. You get to revolt. There's a new culture because revolt is an upstart. It's yeah. new. Yeah. How is that different from coming from these established legacy brands? There's a lot of prayer. <laughs> what would you say? Yeah, a lot, there was a lot of prayer. Like, <laughs> like I, I was, I was so close to God. <laughs> because I'll tell you why. Because there's uncertainty. You don't know what's gonna happen. You, you don't know if it's actually gonna launch. So even when the launch, the date launched, I didn't even get to enjoy it because I was in a zone trying to meet a deadline for the Gate of Revolt, which was like a hip hop pure play, right? It was like a mix show. And, and, and literally got to the operations center like five minutes before the actual launch. Everyone was at a party and I was in the edit bay like, like, yo, is this going through? Is this rendering? Is this, you know what I mean? I was in a zone. So even once I got from the edit bay, it was like, like you know what I mean? Cause you don't, cause now it becomes real. Like, right? Now it becomes real. Like whether all, we spend like a year, a year and a half before we actually got to the air. Like we had social media, we had all this stuff. And and then it just it got so real. And and that's why I said it changed my life because it forced me out of my comfort zone, right? Cause like now I had a nice little run. I was on autopilot. I was on auto cruise. Like, you know what I mean? You see, I, like I memorized phone numbers. Bill don't memorize phone numbers anymore. But you know what I mean? So what happened was now, uh, and all these kids are like calling you OG and this and <laughs> oh, I, I was like, what's going on? I was like, and then RMC Revolt Music Conference changed my life, and one of the best weekends of my life, because first of all, I didn't think it was going to work, but it, and it did, right? You had all these young people who had crowdfunding from uh, like their class, like people would, like have a class and like, yo, I want to go to Revolt, the first Revolt Music Conference. And then they would all chip in and send by a, send, send someone to represent them, like from like Emerson College in Boston or wherever. And it was like unreal. It was like yo, like it was, the energy was crazy, and people coming from Dubai and Nigeria and the people I met there uh, are, are I'm still like you know what I mean like this like that first Revolt Music Conference. And then I introduced the streaming panel, and that that. Open my eyes to some other shit. Like, you know, am I allowed to swear? No, oh, free, yeah, okay, okay. free. Open my eyes to some other shit. Because the, the, literally. What made, you, what made you introduce, and, and it's the perfect segue for where we're about to go, but what made you introduce this, the streaming panel at the I don't the know, it was RMC? like Andre or someone said, Tuma, you're going to introduce the. Oh, I, I didn't sign up for it. They were like, the, the, we had the founder of SoundCloud, Alex Young. And, 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 and I'm sorry to cut you off, but just for anybody watching um, or anybody in the room who doesn't know, he keeps referring to Andre. This is Andre Harrell, who is um, Puff's mentor. Yeah. And, and the founder of Uptown Records, responsible yeah. for some of the greats, Mary J. Blige, Jodeci, so forth and so on. And, the, and he was, now he was responsible for the RMC. So we just showed up and did what we were told, like, right? And, I, and, and by the way, I was a skeptic at first. I was like, it's too early, it's a baby brand to make something that ambitious in such a short time, but it was a wild success. It was incredible. Why do you think the RMC worked? Because of, uh, there was a market hole. There was no How Can I Be Down, there was no Jack the Rapper, there was no Impact Music Conference. So there was no place where young, hungry, passionate, pure artists could get information or game to uh, uh, a network also, find those peers that uh, outside of an uh, educational institution. So all of a sudden you had one and, and they didn't even know about what all the conferences that I just, they didn't even know about it. So they were all excited and it was like, everyone was like positive and no one was over aggressive and you know what I mean? Like it was, everyone was just like chill. And when I say over aggressive, I'm talking about like, like they weren't in your face, like trying to give you like, Hey, this is my mixtape, or you know what I mean? That's, you know what I mean? It was all like, hey, like, hey, I'm so and so. I'm from Memphis. I'm from this, and people were like, like genuinely like bonding. They weren't. It wasn't like, I call it like networking. Glad handing is like, 
when it's like ineffective, where you're just like pushing, pushing, and instead of trying to build a relationship or st stick, you know what I mean? Like stick meaning like, so people remember you next time they see you, or, you know what I mean? That type of thing. So what happens is, it was that environment, and, and also Puff was there, so that helped a lot too, because he, you, he was omnipresent. You saw him actually in the rooms and, you know? But do you mind if, he, I, I think you are, are touching on such an important gem. I don't care, we're talking music right yeah. now. But it doesn't matter what your line of work is. It doesn't matter what business or industry you're in. I asked him why did the Revolt Music Conference work? There was a white space. Mm. There was a hole, there was a gap in the marketplace. Whatever you do, the opportunity is there. Find the white space. Find what is not there. And that is your way to get in and to do something that's in demand. Yeah, so that's that's basically like why it worked, in my my opinion. Like so, you know, so you, in you, hindsight. You, in hindsight. You, you talking about you 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 did the streaming panel there. Well, I introduced it. Yeah. You introduced yeah. the streaming panel. Kenna was the moderator, and then he, I introduced it. Which is, again, it's the perfect segue for where your story gets really, really interesting. Yeah, and that's a, very, it gets very interesting. And then that was all a blur. So if you have any questions about that time, I don't remember shit. <laughs> but what happened was, I get to Spotify. So actually, after I did that, I actually did a decision tree. And the decision tree was, what am I going to do? If, am I going to stay in LA? Move. Am I going to stay in music? You know what I mean? Because I was getting older. Am I going to, you know, if, or, or, or am I going to get out of music and maybe work for like a Coca-Cola and just work in the music department, you know? Uh, uh, was I going to uh, do the tech thing? And if I did a tech thing, what, where are my skills transferable to? You know what I mean? Because I have these skills, but they're not transferable to everywhere, right? So I had to identify companies like, okay, and I did a decision tree, and uh, Spotify was actually in that decision tree. Really? Yes. And I did that decision tree actually the night of I got U.S. citizenship, and uh, Pitbull had invited me to a concert at Staples Center, and I went with the, uh, the, the lady who was my girlfriend at the time, and 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 people didn't even he wasn't even looking for spins he didn't need it. like he and Re Revolt didn't even play pop music, right? But he was I knew him from his mixtape days, when Big Teach yep, and Purple yep. were mm -hmm. like managing him, mm -hmm. and so he was in town and he told uh, this uh, mutual friend Erica like yo two months in LA tell him to come through I go backstage Pitbull's like the biggest artist in the world and I didn't even realize how big he had become and it's him and Enrique Iglesias everyone knew all the words except me. You know what I mean? And I was like, wow. And I'm, I'm with him, like literally in this backstage, watching from the side. And, it's in a, and, and it was Staples Center. And I had just seen Kanye uh, at Staples Center. And I was like, yo, Pitbull's big. And when I did this decision tree, I said, what am I going to do with my life? And the one thing I had to do was, in my heart, and I'm saying this out loud for the, like, for the, is I had to get out of analog cable television. And analog is the opposite of digital. I had to get out of the old, what I considered at the time, the old guard, because I was like, I need to get into like the digital space. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even call it streaming. I just like, I just need to get, like I need to like make that leap. Not, you know, I just need to make that leap because I was seeing the audience dwindle, right? The audience that we were working so hard, the young people, they were shifting to their phones, you know? Even on desktops at the time, laptops even. But they weren't paying for cable. And I, and I, and I, and I, did, I wasn't, I had refused a few TV jobs, because I used to say, hey, don't get it twisted, I'm not a TV guy, I'm a music guy who works for a TV station. I love My that. identity I was, love that. had to be very, very clear, because I used to get TV offers, like even to run a TV station overseas once, like right, in Africa. They're like, yo, we want you to come. I said, I said, I work for MTV, but I'm not a TV guy. I'm a music guy. So I don't want to like uh, oversell myself or misrepresent just for a paycheck, right? So such a beautiful gym. No, no, th th that's gym. it's kept me going, like, you know what I mean? Because identity is very important, you know? It's like even even I, I was just talking to um, a label head today. And they were like talking about like a, a specific label vacancy, 
And they were like, Tuma, do you want it? And I said, no, I'm a buyer, I'm not a seller. You know what I mean? Labels, it's a different hustle. It's, you have to, it's a different conditioning. It's selling. Like, I'm a buyer. I'm like, so it's a, it's a difference between uh, 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 a high jumper and a javelin thrower. It's like both track and field, but it's, it, it, I have to learn what labels do or the, 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 the pace they do it at or the pressure they're under. I, if, I will disrespect the promotion people I've been working for 20 years if I think all of a sudden I'm gonna be able to just do promo just like that. Yeah, but I, I, I think that there's another great point that you're bringing to light is you gotta know who you are and where you're trying to go. Because if you don't know that, there's always gonna be opportunities that come your way. There's always gonna be these offerings that on the surface they look good, but they derail you from your ultimate destiny. And you really have to be in tune with who you are as a human being and where you're trying to go. Because if not, you will accept these opportunities and on the surface they look great, but they keep you further and further and further away from your ultimate goal. And, and, and one of the things is, by the way, you can do stuff, but you have to be prepared for them. And that's, so even the buyer-seller thing, I can become a seller, but if I haven't done the work to prepare, to find out what it takes to be a good one, or the practice, or you know what I mean, or the, or the, the thing, then making that pivot, right, is what Sean is saying. It's like, it's, it's, it's not wise. But if you actually do, you know what I mean? So you can be a renaissance person, like people turn from artists to actors or DJs to producers, but that transition has to happen. Whether it's visible or invisible, it has to happen first. So that's why, uh, uh, the, like in terms of those type of things, like, okay, you know what? I'm actually saying I haven't done the work yet to make that jump, you know? Good. Yeah. I want to talk Spotify. Yeah. You leave, revolt, you go to Spotify. What year did you start Spotify? 2015. Did you create the playlist at Spotify or did you inherit and take the playlist to the next level? So the playlist was a playlist called Hip Hop Monsters with a million followers. Hip Hop Monsters, yeah. okay. This and is what you inherited. I inherited, a play, it was a Swedish lady who did it before in Sweden. And it was called Hip Hop Monsters. It actually had a million followers, right? And I, they, so I go there, I fly to Sweden, and they're like, yeah. I actually did 40 playlists, 42 playlists. When We're going to get to that. 42 We're playlists. But with this one was the flagship and the one we put a lot of uh, emphasis on. And I said, what's the Hip Hop Monster? Like, it doesn't even speak to the culture. And believe it or not, I was looking at a picture of Puff when I thought of the name Rap Caviar. Really? Yeah. Because, you know what, like, they, they, used to, they used to always talk about, like, like just, like, being, like, kind of, like, fabulous and, you know what I mean? And, and, and they know that, like, Andre had uh, um, the champagne of rap, or, you know what I mean? Like, back in the day, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So I, I wanted something that gave, gave, had that touch that said that was self-explanatory, saying this is the top shelf hip-hop. Can, can, you know? can I ask you, because we're jumping a little bit ahead, how long were you at Spotify? So you inherit one major playlist. No, I, I, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. You inherit one At what point, because I love the fact that, that you were bold enough and you're coming in there yeah. with enough knowledge which, of, of, of your culture and your craft that you... What, what's a rap monster? It doesn't yeah, even make yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, it's this, never gonna fly yeah, with our people. Yeah, this sounds like uh, like those. Remember those commercials back in the day, like the, like like with the, the the hits. Like now, this is CD now, or oh, this yeah. is what I call hits. Or I was like, what is this? In in how long before you said we need to change this name? Oh, no, right away. Right away. Right away. I no, love it. No, no, they listen to me too. I, I they they. they Right away, like literally, I was in Sweden, and they said we need a name, and I said, okay, rap caviar, and then, and then they went and copyrighted it. They did all the you know, intellectual property stuff, 
squatted on the dot, uh, the dot com and the social media handles. Literally, immediately, they went, got the, all the social media handles, everything right away, and then they published the name, like, right away. I have, I, I was, I haven't, I haven't even, like, I hadn't, I had to take, I had to go back to LA well, to, to. So move. this is 2015 you're doing this? Yeah, 2015. It was you May 5th, May, May 7th, 2015, because uh, I just checked some old emails. Uh, I just looked it up. It was May 7th, 20, so this is going to be the fifth year anniversary. Nice. Yeah. Earlier May in the 11th, conversation, maybe. May 11th, maybe. he's talking 1997. Yeah. 2015, 18 years. Later, yeah. Because rap caviar, and I'll let you tell your own story, there's no such things as overnight successes. It, it, it is no such thing. We're talking 18 years in the making. Spotify, streaming, it did not exist in 1997. He talked about preparation. He's being prepared. He's being groomed. He's programming. Spotify comes into existence. Again, white space. There's a hole in the marketplace. There's a late, Spotify is founded in Sweden. There's a woman who is not from the culture, programming hip hop. Yeah. He falls into his destiny. And, and, it, and, get, and, it, was, and it was stuff like, like, like stuff like D4L, Laffy Taffy would be like an R&B playlist. Or, or you know what I mean? Or you know what I mean? Like, I'm just giving you some nuance. You know what I mean? I'm just giving you some nuance of like some of the stuff that was kind of, when, when Majima who did the R&B was like, would find like, a Cameron song. It's like, what is this? Like, you know what I mean? The wrong place. Like, there wasn't. It was, so it was more of like the nuance. Like, we brought well, the, spe the speaking inside, of nuance, we're like the insider point of view. We brought the insider point of view. Yeah. Spe speaking of nuance, you spent the majority of your career up into that point, a programmer. Yeah. Now you're a curator. Yeah. Explain the difference. It's like to me, the difference between a curator and a. Pro I was actually even when I was a programmer, I considered myself a curator. Right, but the difference is like the difference between a chef and a cook, or you know what I mean. Like anyone can cook, but not anyone can chef. Chef is taking it to a different level in terms of the way it's um, the process, presentation. You see what I'm saying? The 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 naming or the meaning, the identity, etc. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's the same thing with like programming, or, or is is a lot more manual, it's more technical. So it's like the difference between making beats and being a producer, right? The producer part Big is about it's a, energy. It's about the energy. It's about the aura. It's about, you know what I mean? It's about the, the emotional connection, right? Making a beat is, you know what I mean? You're making a beat, and that's cool. And it's, a, and, and it's, a, and it's, the fundam it's part of the fundamental, but that's the difference, in, in my opinion, you know? You inherit a playlist, yeah. change the name, one million, yeah. Um, followers at that time. Yeah. By the time you was done Better putting than, your like, touch yeah, on it, yeah. how many followers? I don't know. I think it was like, it was like eight. No, I, nine, know. I don't know. It was what it, nine million. Nine million? Okay, okay. Nine okay. million followers. I, yeah, yeah. By but, the time but, by you, the way, by the way, I never cared about the follower part. Okay. I only cared, to be honest with you, the follower part, I looked at it as a vanity metric, right? Because not all the followers are going to be listening all the time, right? The part I cared about was the numbers you couldn't see. And that was the daily active users and the monthly active users. The daily active users, for me, represented the passionate core. And those are the most important to, to me, is that not to punish the believers or the early, you know what I mean, or the, the, the thing. And, and then the monthly active users was the casual, right? And that was a big number. It was, I'm not, I'm not even, probably legally even allowed to say, but it was a big number, the monthly active users, it was more casual. And so those are the, the numbers that you weren't able to see, and it, they'll fluctuate. And, and you, I, I could see people listen on this day more than this day, or this day this, and this is a good day to, you know what I mean? Freshen it up. And so that's, that's actually what I believe. Okay, here, I'm gonna drop the gem. And this is what I learned at MTV. MTV jams had no ratings. So I was, I learned to not care about the number of viewers, to care about the number of believers. Because a viewer just watches. You were asking about the difference between a chef and a cook. A viewer just watches. A believer watches 
tells a friend, looks up an artist on social media, or goes and downloads, at the time iTunes was big, downloads a song on iTunes, buys a ticket to the show, right? Watches again. And then tells a friend who they put on to that, like, oh, okay, and I'm, I watched it on MTV. So now you have more. So you have a compound effect. A viewer is passive, it just watches, and you get your number, but then it comes and goes, right? You built your house on the sand, right? The, the, the artists that get those casual fans that really don't like have that thing, oh, sorry, sorry, that mic, is, is, I'm sorry, sorry, is, they, they, that's what, those are the ones that come and go, because nobody cares. So, the, here, I'll just give you a gem. This is how I live in terms of the way I work. So that's why I'm never, I was never interested in the fault. I let the other people say, talk about that. I couldn't care less if that shit was a hundred. If I was a hundred, I would go, no, it's hundred, I'm gonna go hard for it. And I'd rather have a hundred believers than fucking a hundred thousand followers. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful gem, yeah. beautiful gem. You know, I remember coming up to Spotify to visit you. Yeah. And it was my first introduction into the new music industry. Mm. Um, it, it it was it, the, the company. It's a tech company yeah. that just happens to specialize in music. Um, but you were able to share something with me that stuck with me to this day because I, that, that's when I knew it's time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. When I got into the music industry, everything was about this. It was about your air. It was about your heart. It was about what you felt. You introduced me to technology, data, analytics, and the way you were walking me through the process of showing this is going to be a hit. Tuma, I've never even heard of this person. Come here, look at this. And you're showing me the data behind records that we never even heard of. How, for you, you're getting older in the game. You're learning a new skill set. How much do you believe in metrics or analytics and data versus what you can hear? Because it's it's very different well, now. Well, uh, I'm going to quote Troy Carter, who, who was the head of like artist labor yep. relations at Spotify. He used to use this term, and I really liked it because it really represented what we're talking about. It was the balance between data and gut, right? And the data, data and what? Data and gut. Okay. Right? So the data part is what's happening. It's not really, it's not about the numbers. It's, it's about the behavior. So if you're looking and this many people are searching for something or this many people are saving stuff into their own playlist, you know what I mean? It's, it's, your, it's, it's a sign of interest or a sign of a follow up. It's, you know, uh, if, if, if something is, has low skip rates, then people aren't skipping it. Like, the skips don't lie. Like, you know what I mean? That's just, like, you know, like, uh, like, the Shakira said, you know? Yeah, he, he, he got it. I it uh, appreciate that, too. So, but, but what happens is, so things like that were just basically early indicators, you know what I mean? And signals. So it wasn't always um, biblical, because that's where the gut comes in. You know, like, why? Or is this actually any good? Or is this just because people are doing the hokey pokey, which is the latest dance craze, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, and no knock to the hokey pokey, you know. But, but you had to basically like, like, like be like, okay, what's actually going on here? And and who who is this? Are these like five year olds, or are these like like the people in the clubs that actually make things pop and hot and 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 go back to the their school and and people actually like. Uh, pay attention or like to what they're wearing or you know what I mean etc cetera, etc cetera. So, so that was the and then the gut is also just listen to is it any good or and when I say any good it's not about my taste but it's more about like um, I read it in a book it's called emotional quality control right emotional quality control Mercedes does it where they have a car but they still have someone go and sit in it and see how does the feel yeah how does it how does it smell? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like okay, it's ready. There was, oh, it's something's off. Like, you know? Maybe, you see what I'm saying? So, the, so, so that's where the music part and the listening part is like, yo, this is actually like really, really good. Or this is like really, really different. And maybe this will work in a more experimental. Maybe this will work in a workout playlist. Maybe this will work 
in our early bets where the, the consumers, or not even consumers, because the consumer is a cold word, where the, uh, uh, the fans. fans, exactly, the fans are more adventurous, you know, than these ones who, who are uh, very, very busy because they got kids, you know, et cetera. We talk about technology, yeah. and, and you're, you're bringing us into the future of the music industry. Yeah. Every industry changes, guys. You don't want to, he spoke about being analog in a digital world. You don't want to be that person. So hopefully, whatever you're doing with your life, you are actively trying to grow your skill set. Very important. But another way that rap caviar in those playlists, they forever change the music industry. The music industry, for any of you guys that don't know, suffered a terrible beating in the early 2000s. One, because of streaming and downloading. Music industry fought against um, the downloads because it was taking money out of what their business model was, which was selling CDs. Now the music industry is embracing companies like Spotify. And YouTube. And YouTube. And we're yeah. going to get to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move it on. But question for you. Are labels still necessary? Yeah, absolutely. Even, even the, and I ask you this oh. because absolutely, companies like Spotify pay the artists directly. Yeah. And if the artists are blessed enough that their uh, music makes it onto these playlists, they can actually earn a great living no, no. I mean, independently. If you're a lifestyle artist and all you want is to make enough money to live decently, then you don't need a label. But if you're an artist that wants to be um, on big festival stages and on radio stations and to be remembered in history and et cetera, et cetera, th that help or that machine helps a lot. Like you can't, you're one human being or if you have a small team, you're a, a small team. Um, I did a, um, uh, someone asked me that in Australia. And I was like, uh, and, I, and what I said was like, uh, every, everyone's working hard now. And everyone's working smart now. Everyone has a team, right? And and everyone and and the third part was work art. You know what I mean? Like work artfully, right? Work hard, work smart, work art, right? So what happens is, is in order for you to do that, you you know what I mean? You need to be competitive in in these. You need a whole bunch of people working hard on your behalf. That's why artists get mad at labels like you're not pushing my stuff hard enough, or et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? You need. In order to be competitive, it's almost like these super teams where LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, oh, you gonna go with three superstars? Oh, you better have three superstars of your own to compete or or create the Golden State Warriors, turn these guys into superstars or or, or Oklahoma City with when Kevin Durant and James Harden and and Russell Westbrook, or you know what I mean? Or the, if you want to like actually compete, because. Because the, the other artists are going to, so you can you can do it if you want, and if you want to just make enough money, that's great. But if you really want, and a lot of they, 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 start them. Just people want to be iconic. People want to, the music to be remembered. People want uh, 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 people in other places to know the words or to be inspired or whatever. And it's just there's so much competition right now. So easy to get. Um, uh, uh, lost in that, you know what I mean? Ocean of, comp you know what I mean? Of, it's much worse than when we were coming up. Much far worse. More, far more. Just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna fast forward this, but I got a couple of questions before I get to YouTube. Um, hip hop yeah. is the number one most consumed yeah. art form in music, yeah. hands down. Mm -hmm. How much do you think technology plays into that? Hip hop has always been the number one for a long time, but hip hop's popularity um, uh, was uh, kind of—I don't want to say disguised, but or camouflage. But there was a hidden market. Things like mixtapes, things like the streets that were not measurable, right? And they were not being monetized, right? And uh, and so what technology or streaming did was measure. Right when everything when things shifted from some of these like websites and etc. 
now all of a sudden you had the, the metrics, you know what I mean, to back up what we already knew. And that was the fight we had in these companies. We were Correct. talking about the brain trust. But like, yo, this is huge. What are you talking about? Like, wh whether it be an award show or whatever, you'd be mad. Like, what? Nobody's checking for that. We knew this. But now all of a sudden we had the evidence because there was money getting paid out. So money forces hands and it creates a, a different level of attention when it comes to like the like the, um, the, the check writers, you know what I mean? Uh, so so, so it, it had always been, it had been for a while. It was just that the, the rest of the world didn't, it had to catch up in terms of like proof, because that money was, they didn't understand hip hop's language, but they understood money's language. I love that. You know what I mean? I so it. once it, the, the conversation shifted there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know. One quick question, we're gonna to go to, to YouTube, yeah. which I think is an important part of your story. I sit and I look at you. Yeah. Same tumor. Yeah. From day one. Yeah. You are arguably one of the most powerful gatekeepers. No, I'm not a gatekeeper. Gatekeepers? No, I'm not a gatekeeper. I used to be a gatekeeper a long time ago, but that era is over. Okay. The gatekeeper era is over. The gatekeeper era, right. no, it still exists in some rights. No, but yeah, let's just say, the gatekeepers are the everybody yeah, yeah. is trying to get in touch with Tuma. How do you balance? How do you balance telling your friends no? Telling your friends, I can't do it. Well, I, I know yeah. me adding you to this playlist uh, yeah. could potentially change your life. But I just can't. How does the power not go to your head? Oh no! The, 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 I mean, is the pop? Oh, no, man, that's. A, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, the, the 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 reality is all this stuff comes and goes. You know what I mean? And then also, uh, I think the reason why we do this is very important. You know what I mean? If 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 you do it for those type of things, right? Uh, I think you place an improportional amount of value on stuff that will evaporate quickly. Right, and, and and the one cool thing about spending a lot of time um, like grinding is uh, you see a lot of people believe the wrong things. They start to believe the hype. They start thinking all this shit is real, and they start doing it for the wrong reasons. They start mistreating people. You know what I mean? They start. You see what I'm saying? So for what you're talking about is more communication capacity. It's impossible to get. You know what I mean? It's impossible. Like you. It, it's, it really depends on the time of day you catch, or you know what I mean, or whatever. It's impossible uh, to uh, respond to everything. But what happens? Because especially when you have like a job and you're trying to like, you know what I mean, like bro, oh, like oh, but you try, try. But what happens is this: uh, just don't believe the hype. Simple as that. Don't, you know what I mean? You, well, you know, I'm, you, I'm, you I'm know, you know, you, yeah, you, know you know, it's not real. You, 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 you know, you, you know, it's not real. For you and I, we yeah, might know that it's not yeah, real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but. Lesson for anybody watching this, anybody in the room, it's as simple as this. Um, music industry is, that, that's a coveted industry. It's very small. It is actually built to keep people out. So I could see why, you know, it would go to people's heads yeah. when they get in and then they ascend to a certain and level. And then they think it's them. It's not you. And it's that's the work. The point. It's the essence. That's the point. It's not you. It's it never to do you. With you. It has nothing to do with All this stuff you're talking about has nothing to do with me. I'll take the credit. Yeah. But guess what? It's not me. It's, it's the, the people position. I work with. No, it's no, the it's the I... position that's hot. No, it's no, not no, you. No, no, You're no, no, interchangeable. No, no, the position. The thing is this. Okay, all right. There's different kinds of power. We talk about power. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Why talk about power? Go Let's talk about power. There's different and, kinds and, of power. And then we're gonna go to YouTube. Okay. There's soft power. There's hard power. Right. Hard power is the kind of power like I can hurt you. Like you know what I mean. I have a gun, or I can fire you. I can stop your funds from coming in. No more direct deposit. Right, soft power is a little bit different, and that's like relationships, and that's like knowledge. You know what I mean? That's like uh, like a persuasion or charisma or diplomacy. Like, hey, hey, can I get a drink of your water, please? And you're like, sure, because I said please. Now I have water, right? Like, right? So that's a different type of. Power. And now, one of the things I learned very early was about positional power. And that's the gatekeeping thing, right? Is if you have a position and 
you ignore all the other stuff, once that positional power is gone, you're, you're also gone. You know why? Because people were fucking with you because they had to. You built a whole bunch of hostage relationships, not real relationships, based on reciprocation, information, uh, 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 well-being, or like welfare. You see what I'm saying? So, so because you were popular at the time, that's why they were fucking with you. Or you were good looking. Well, you know, it's something that changes. <laughs> and it would changes, right? Uh, or because you had money, or you were the it thing. You see what I'm saying? So if you have to stop believing this shit, and you think that like because you're hot right now, that you're gonna be hot tomorrow, or you're not gonna put in the same kind of work or effort or relationship building uh, rigor, right? You're screwed. And we've seen this a hundred million times. And we've seen the best of the best work hard to maintain the relationship. Like me and Sean have had front row seats to Puff, and he puts in a lot of work into keep the staying informed and staying in touch with people. And it's, and it's impossible. For so the thing is this, if the people at the top are going that hard, but you don't see any of that. All you see is the part, the final results. You don't see the rough cuts. You don't see all the feedback. You don't see the, the arguments or, or you don't see any of that tension, unless it's like televised. But so you start believe, people start believing it. And, and that's a huge mistake. And it's a mistake that keeps on being made over and over and over again. And those of us who've been around for a while, just look like, oh, I keep making that mistake. It's all right. All right. Yeah, that means I don't have to deal with you anymore. You see what exactly. I'm saying? It's simple as that because times are come. That's a, this is gravity. What comes up comes down. It is gravity. E equals MC squared. Is that, is that the gravity? I think that's yeah, yeah. relativity. Relativity, relativity. But yeah, 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 yeah. Relativity. we'll take it. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay you're yeah. now at YouTube. Yeah. Who brings you over to YouTube? Lior. Lior. Cohen. Lior Cohen. Iconic yeah. name yeah, in yeah, hip hop. Yeah. Your story comes so full circle. You have worked with the best of the work, the best. You work with Sean Diddy Combs at Revolt. Somebody who you were looking at his music or watching his yeah. stuff in Iowa or yeah, wherever yeah, yeah. the heck you were. Yeah, yeah. Now you with even, yeah. you know Russell Simmons partner Leo. Yeah, what yeah. do you do at YouTube? Uh, so basically, um, uh, okay. So urban music we call it urban music, but it's really black music, right? Urban is a euphemism for black. It's industry jargon because they don't have something better to call it right now, right? It's up to us to change, if we want to change it, but it's not one person who can change it. So urban music, so hip hop, R&B, reggae, um, Afro beats, gospel, uh, you know what I mean, adult contemporary, soul, you know what I mean? Like, so basically, things that come from uh, our culture, right, is my job is to make sure that when we address it, or we do things that we do it right. Right, that we do it with the right people, that that the right amount of resources get put into it. That so I work with the um, YouTube's from the artist relations to label relations to YouTube Spaces to the YouTube Press who approved this. I had to get this approved. I can't just go talk. You know what I mean? Uh, YouTube marketing. Whenever we do events. Uh, or, or out of home, like the billboards, uh, YouTube uh, International, like I talked to the Nigeria and the London office and Aust Australia and, and Japan and Korea. Uh, 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 YouTube, oh my gosh, there's so much, there is so much, right? But it's basically, uh, is just kind of basically not the, the, right, the right tool strategy. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, working with, uh, kind of being a hub and then also, uh, something I was saying to that said to you. That said to you is I was saying like also kind of being an ambassador also you know. So when YouTube has new things, best practices or you know it's like like there's point people that that we have somebody to, to to that can put you in the right direction. YouTube originals, that's a big thing that YouTube has been working on for. There's a lot. There's just a lot. So a lot. So, so I'm the director of that. I'm so I'm the guy who's trying to just, just get it popping, like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm still early, it's still very early. I know yeah. you created uh, a, a similar model to what was over at Spotify, 
um, in terms of the playlist at YouTube now. So I can't take credit for that, but I, I mean, I, uh, I was in the room and b big part of that. Um, so we have a new uh, uh, like flagship playlist called On Everything. On Everything. So I, like, basically, I put that on everything. These are songs that we swear by, you know what I mean? So I put like, you know, like on my mama or whatever. So on everything, yeah. So on everything is the, it's, it's brand new. It's a couple, just a couple weeks old. It's gonna take a little while. It, it, it's, the numbers are good, but it's gonna take a little while before it really penetrates like the culture. And there's a, a lot of uh, strategy that's going into Highline. Also is the R&B is beautiful. Go look at it this week with uh, Neo on the cover. This is, uh, so so th these are the, th these are, things that take a long time and and also people have a lot of choices right now like you know it's a different marketplace and, that, from and that's five years my ago. that's my next question to you there are a lot of choices yes. out there yes what is the benefits of artists investing their career and their time in YouTube reach YouTube's reach is ridiculous it's like two billion daily active users daily daily yeah that, and you know what I mean like why am I supposed to say that number? It's a lot of it? users. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, I mean, the, in in, in well, terms well, of is websites, it, so what, 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 it, is that ranked number two outside of Google? Uh, it's either two or three in, terms in the of, world. I think uh, I think for search engines, it's like the, uh, I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say actually. Okay, so, yeah. uh, but it's uh, but it's number two. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> it, it is, yeah, after Google. So the, the thing is this is uh, is it's humongous. It's like it's it's humongous, and also. Not only it's humongous, it's like it's 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 democratic. It's uh it's level the playing field, right? Anyone, all of you can have accounts. All of you can upload. All of you can curate your channels. All of you, you see what I'm saying? That can monetize and make money off of your YouTube, right? So that's my appeal. I'm from Africa originally. I I go there. I see how people really go hard with YouTube. When I'm in the barbershop. I see how the people, I see with my own eyes. So. So in terms of the benefit, it's like self-explanatory, right? But now it's like now it's more about dopeness, like how to make it really like you know what I mean, like quality, like like just interesting. You know? how, so how and, and, and you, how do we how do we optimize it? How do we benefit from it? Like you know what I'm saying? Like you know, and not sleep on something that's like this like historic engine or platform, you know, or not take it for granted, you know, or the the or or reaching people in the Caribbean or, you know, like the world is becoming smaller, like literally because of things like YouTube and social media too. Social media is a big part of that also. And social media helps rise the boat of YouTube, you know? Yeah. A lot of, I, I watched you break a lot of artists out of um, your position when you were at Spotify. Um, Young M.A. really got popping through um, the playlist. Cardi. Um, so many of them. Um, I remember coming up there and, and you telling me about XXX, ten, ten, whatever you say his name. But the point is, has there been any success stories yet out of YouTube? Um, uh, uh, by the way, all of these have to go through YouTube first, right? Like all these get popping on YouTube first. And even when you're talking about breaking artists, it's really hard nowadays to take credit for breaking artists because there's so much happening of the, they've built their own audiences on these different platforms, you see what I'm saying? So so all those artists were putting their freestyles or their vlogs or et cetera, et cetera, and building these audiences and then showing, remember we were talking about earlier about demonstrating the demand. So the, so the proof was there, proof of concept, the proof was in the pudding, right? So nobody just got some magical lottery, you know what I mean? The thing is that they worked for it. They built audiences and they built, they had a voice, right? And they were consistent and said, hey, you know what? It's time. And sometimes you're early and then you look like a genius because you're early, but but they did it. You know what I'm saying? Cardi did that. Young M.A. did that. You see what I'm saying? Like, like all the invisible work that went into, let's say, uh, uh, young M.A. when, ooh, her performing at like Lust or Starlets or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, like you see what I'm saying? That translates onto YouTube. Something that um, a, a label said was, when there's an earthquake on YouTube, you feel the tremors on all of the streaming platforms. Nice. You know what I mean? Nice. So, so what happens is, it's also the same thing in real life. What you do in real life, when you put it on YouTube or whatever, it, yeah, exactly. 
Because people in Flatbush are actually checking for it. And they're looking for it. You see what I'm saying? So what happens is this. So these things don't happen in a vacuum. Right? And we have to take the mystique out of that. that like, oh, okay. Like, all, all of a sudden, like, oh, so-and-so became so-and-so. No, no, no. If so-and-so all of a sudden became so-and-so, they're all of a sudden going to disappear, too. Simple as that. So, sorry, sorry. Just in terms of winding this down, because I can talk to you all night. Like, like I love our conversation. There's going to be a lot of managers, a lot of artists, a lot of record labels watching this interview. Mm-hmm. Two billion daily active viewers on YouTube. You post a video that is literally one rain drop in the Pacific Ocean. Can you give us any kind, or can you give them, people who are trying to stand out on a platform that is that busy, that vast, what tips can you give them to stand out on YouTube? So, so you know, when I was a, like a student, I used to always try to like, 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 not memorize, but like codify things so I could remember it, right? Or whether it be making a song or a rhyme or, you know what I mean, initials or et cetera. And one of the things that uh, I like is, uh, is bed PC, right? You start with your branding, how you present yourself on your YouTube page, your engagement, right? Liking comments, replying, uh, uh, tweeting on your uh, or linking my bio, etc. Uh, diversifying the the D part is like uh, making sure that you're like going to an aggregator or distributor so you can monetize. You see what I'm saying? So that if you're starting to pop or you're starting to go viral or you're actually building audience, because it takes a long time. Like for a long time, nobody is checking your stuff, and then all of a sudden you start getting momentum. You know what I mean? So the, the, the diversifying and, and working with other people, being on other people's pages, using the community, uh, P, partnering, you know what I mean? Maybe uh, uh, trying to do things once you have a certain number, you know, uh, with I, other I, I companies. I was actually hoping, hoping you would give us some insider information, but this sounds like it's from the, the, the handbook. It is. So yeah, I'm not going to get anything out of you. So <laughs> quick question no, no, for you. No, no, I made that up, by the way. <laughs> That's a handbook. Yeah, but 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 it definitely does yeah, yeah, sound yeah, yeah. very very. No 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 no. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was going to get some insider no, no, trading no, 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 here. No 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 no. I didn't yeah. I made that up. I didn't even get to the C part. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. I'll leave that out. So okay. we're in here. What's the best advice you ever got? I don't know, man. That's a hard one. Uh, best advice I ever got. Oh okay, yeah, I'll give you best advice, and I live by this, and this has kind of kept me going. Is when you're working on anything, uh, what you try to figure out is how can I add value, right? And if I can't add value, maybe this isn't the place where or the thing I should be working on. Or if I'm redundant, then, you know, I'm wasting my time. Someone's already taken care of that. So I got that advice. It was um, uh, one of the senior executives at uh, VH1, Richard Gay. It was... It was it, it, there weren't very many like high-level African American uh, executives like Viacom at the time, and Richard Gay was like one of the highest-ranking. He was like like uh, at VH1, and I went to his office and he was like, "Yo, like don't don't sweat that. Just just figure out how you can add value. That's it." And I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's it!" And I, I live by that now. Where I'm like, if I if I can't add value, then it's okay. I'm I'm okay with not being a part of it. That's fine. Even if it's a meeting or whatever, I'm not offended. Because if I can't add value, I'm going to go add value somewhere else. So I'm going to focus on what I have rather than uh, dwelling on what I don't. You know what I mean? What's the worst advice you ever got? Oh, oh my gosh. You're asking hard questions. The way you get in. <laughs> um, the worst advice I ever got. Oh, man. I, I, that I, I don't know. Uh, like like in, in career advice or? Just in life. In life? And we can come back to it. Yeah, yeah, because that's a hard one. I've never even thought about that. Um, even that, even that value thing, I just like. Uh, but I think just, that that's great advice. Okay, you okay, just yeah, gave. yeah. You know, if you can go back in time. Yeah. What advice are you giving to your twenty-year-old self? Twenty. Okay, I, I was twenty in 1995, so I was in school. Buy in Brooklyn. 
<laughs> Buy a brownstone. <laughs> <laughs> like, yo, you know what I mean? Just pay off that Discover credit card, fix your credit. You go buy, go, you know what I mean? Like, like bed Crown Heights, like, you know what I mean? Like some of the vacant lots, lever, you get loans, buy in Brooklyn, like literally. Give it up for this week's power move maker, Mr. Tuma Basso. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.